This is Do It For A Living, your source for inside information on the future of automotive performance. We always strive to sell quality products, even if they cost more, because in the end, they don't cost you more because you're not, you know, you're not just throwing it away a, a year later when it breaks or doesn't perform. What's holding you back from starting or growing your business into what it can be? Well, if you're listening to this, it's not a lack of information. What you're about to hear is all you need to get motivated and start making waves. Do It For A Living podcast details the journey of today's true players in their own words. Find out how they broke out so you can too. The time is now. The time is always now. Hey, everybody. It's Todd Ersley back again on the Do It For A Living podcast. Um, with me today, I have Ken Anderson, and he is the president of Mountune USA. Um, how are you doing today, Ken? I'm doing great. Oh, good to have you, man. I'm uh, really excited about this one. Uh, personally, for me, I'm excited because I want to hear more about Mountune USA because I recently picked up the uh, Ford Focus RS, and I know Mountune has been doing stuff with um, the the RS platform and Ford for many, many, many years. And so um, I'm personally curious to hear about the story behind you guys. But uh, let's uh, let's go ahead and dive right in. So if you could, please kind of give us um, the history, you know, where did you start out in racing or in cars or even before that? You know, what did, what did you do growing up as a kid, uh, you know, kind of before you entered into the Mountain um, in the Mountain company? Yeah, well, that was many years ago, but uh, I was uh, <laughs> I was born and, and raised here in in Southern California in LA County, and um, so you know it's the culture here in LA and in Southern California. There's you know I I, I grew up in the the seventies and and eighties, and so as a kid, you did what kids do: skateboard, went to the beach. Uh, BMX, that type of stuff. Mm -hmm. I, I guess as as a younger, you know, as a kid, I was really. I don't recall ever really being into cars. I mean, I guess I liked cars, but um, I would probably say though that I was always felt mechanically inclined. I mean, we, my friends and I, we wor we'd work on our bikes, and you know, we'd modify the bikes and build jumps and ramps and all the types of things you did back at that, you know, when you could do that stuff and you did it and rode around and, you know, we, when skateboards first came out in the seventies, we all had those and we did that type of stuff. And, and, um, so, you know, I, I wasn't one of the, these, these kids that are just, you know, pick up the magazines and you're looking at everything and, and road and track or that type of stuff. My, my father was, was also mechanically inclined. So he was always working on the cars and I guess, uh, the family cars. And I guess that's something, again, that you did more so back then than you do now because cars needed, you know, the yeah, car yeah. was rebuilt. And, and so I think I picked up a lot of things, um, you know, just watching them and being in the garage and, you know, you just, the things you did, you did brake jobs on your cars, you changed the clutches and, and that. And so, um, you know, it's, it's, it's certainly, I had slot cars and, trains model trains i mean you know there was a time that i was really into into that and and uh, uh so anything mechanical has always interested uh me and um and when when i did get my license at 16 um uh one of my sisters gave me uh, uh her volkswagen bug which was a 64 and i i guess i just drove it i mean it was it was just a cool car, and then I think one day I picked up a Hot VWs magazine, and wow, there was you know it was a whole new world. I mean, <laughs> there there so was stuff thing, you could do to it. <laughs> yeah, stuff you could do, and you know it's important to remember this is this is long before the internet existed. So you, you know you, you got your knowledge and your information in and, and, and magazines and and that type of stuff, and then you'd go to the local sh speed shop, and there was a couple that we always visited. One was called Johnny Speed and Chrome, and in, in in Orange County, and we'd go out there and, and look at all the all the parts that we really wanted, the big 48 IDA Weber carbs, and and uh, so I, I messed around with a you know Volkswagen Bug for quite a while and built an engine, and that was back in the the, the heady times of the 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 Volkswagen drag racing scene mm -hmm. here in Southern California, the Bug ends and all of that. So I did all that, and and. Um, um, well, I actually, you know, I graduated high school in 1983, and that that we 
the family we still have that volkswagen bug so it's still, it's still it's, in the yeah, family it's, huh? it's, it's in my dad's it's lives in my mom and dad's uh, garage does and, it does uh, it run does it oh still yeah it run? absolutely oh, okay. runs yeah i mean it's it's in very good shape and it's you know mostly all original now i think my father took all the all the hot rod parts that i had on it and yeah. put it back to stock but uh you know and that's i think you know for me i mean it was just an education because we did you know you just worked on your car you you learned how to do things you learned how to change the oil you learned how to change the fan belt or the generator you remember it's a generator not an alternator on those things <laughs> yes, and, yeah. you know and drum brakes all around and and um so i had that car and uh graduated high school and I was going to college and I got a job at a, at a Honda dealer here in Southern California that was at the, you know, and this was in, I guess, probably 1984, 1985 mm -hmm. and, and working in the parts department while I went to school and, and it really wasn't, I mean, it was just a job, you know, and yeah, was handing, yeah. handing out oil filters and timing belts and that to the mechanics at the back counter. And, and I remember to this day, and I, I came in one day, and and there was a Mugen catalog sitting on the parts manager's desk, and and that, if you recall, that was the first generation CRX, and I don't know, it's probably the second or third generation Civic at that mm -hmm. time. But so eighty four, eighty five, and 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 Honda, American Honda Corporation, they were actually the importer of Mugen parts at that time. You could buy them through the the dealership and they were part of the, their accessory program. So they had shocks and headers and exhausts and all kinds of cool stuff. And anyways, walked in and saw the catalog on his desk and it was like, what is this? I mean, this <laughs> is the coolest stuff. I would just, the quality, you, know, you could just tell. And he goes, well, you know, they want us to be a, they want us to be a, a dealer for the like stuff. Dealer, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, do you want to do it? And I said, well, let's try it. So, he kind of put me in charge of being the Mugen guy at the, the dealership. So we made a little display in the parts department. And and in any case, people started buying the products. And, and in a relatively short amount of time, uh, you know, we became the largest Mugen dealer in the country. And oh, wow. Yeah. Well, no, I mean, you have to put that in perspective because that really wasn't much. <laughs> you know, <there laughs> yeah, I guess so. <laughs> three or four dealers in the country that were willing to sell the parts. But we were we were close to um, Honda here in Southern California. Mm -hmm. So uh, the executives there would bring people from Japan to the dealer to see the parts. And so we got to be quite – uh, well known for that. Yeah, and I'm guessing I mean, and, being on the West Coast, that's going to get you know, you guys were the hub for yeah. where all the imports started. So yeah, the, all the you know, and and the CRX was gaining popularity, and there of course at the time there was Jackson Racing, and and he was Oscar Jackson was doing a lot of the Honda stuff, and so I became friends with him, and and became friends with a lot of the guys at um at Honda that were doing the, the racing of the CRX. So the Mugen had a GT, a SCCA GT4 class car. And and um, so I'd go to the races and kind of befriended those guys. And one day I decided, I said, well, I'd like to get more into racing. And at the time, those engines, uh, the racing engines were being built by a company called uh, RC Engineering. And you may have heard of them from their, the, I, I, they later evolved the company into doing um, uh, upgraded fuel injectors. Okay. And um, but at the time, he had Rusk RC engineers, Russ Collins, he he was famous for building Honda four-cylinder motorcycle engines, drag racing engines, things like that. So he was their de facto works engine builder. So, anyways, they they the guys at Honda said, well, you should go down and talk to Russ, and he was in Huntington Beach at the time, and they may need a some help and so I went down there and interviewed and he hired me and he said well you know you're just like a shop assistant okay yeah starting at the bottom huh yeah well yeah, yeah. Was, I mean was, yeah. so I quit the Honda dealer and and entered the uh, exciting world of you know performance in motorsports and uh, my first my first job there was rebuilding connecting rods and and um you know, so we take the connecting rods apart and grind them and resize them, and it was a messy, dirty job. But I'd have to say, in, in the time period that I worked there, it was probably a year, year and a half. That it was, it, I learned more about engines and and you know engine dynamics and and there than 
I was like going to Harvard or Yale of engineering. Engine, engines. And, <laughs> I'd like I mean, to it was that. amazing. <laughs> yeah, I loved a lot. And it was a great place. Uh, you know, Russ Collins was very talented, and and the other guys that were working there that, um, you know, they, they basically taught me everything that I knew that I know now about engines and how they work, and you know, the the really kind of the black art of you know building an engine. And um, you know, we, it was very busy and exciting times. We were going to IMSA races and SCCA races, and I was effectively building engines and doing track support. And uh, but. Uh, you know, there was a time, I mean, you, you know, this was by then was the late 80s. And, um, you know, I kind of wanted a little bit more than than what I could get out of that mm -hmm. company. It was relatively small. And, and uh, so HKS, uh, which you've probably heard of, a Japanese tuning company, was just coming into the States. And um, so they were, you know, they were establishing an office here in Southern California. And, and I heard through the grapevine. So I went down there and applied and, and Got a job as a salesperson because they wanted some somebody that had technical experience and and so. Um, and so, had you had you uh, did you graduate or when did you graduate high school? In 1983. Okay, okay. So you had been working in the automotive industry for some time after that. Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, it was probably four or five years. Um, you know, at the deal at the Honda dealer and uh -huh. then at. RC engineering before I got on it at, at HKS, which is like, you know, I guess I'd have to look it up, but it was probably about 1986, 88, okay. something like that. And again, you know, they were just coming into the States. And, and so, yeah, that was some, probably some really exciting, <laughs> exciting times though. Like, well, I mean, it was, and I remember, I mean, you know, they, if you look at, uh, you know, their exhaust systems back then, very similar to what uh -huh. they are now, flanged exhaust systems that, that didn't exist in America. I mean, you know, exhaust systems on cars were one piece, you know, you had to cut them off and weld yeah. it all. I mean, it, you know, to me, it was just like, wow, this is, these, this is like jewelry. I mean, it was just beautiful, you know, and the, and the, and the F-Con, which was their device to, to program the, or actually uh, work in conjunction with the factory ECU, you know, it's a way to tune the ECU and intercoolers and pistons. And I mean, they just had a plethora of parts mm -hmm. that, it was just it just didn't exist just you know? uh, totally unheard of for yeah the rest and of the thing. like wow this is crazy and and um you know we're still pre-internet days and and so uh, it was just but everybody was so you know there was no disadvantage of that uh, without the internet but we had catalogs and we'd we'd call sh you know call shops to sell products and um and just really just pushed our way through and, and created, you know, created a market. We started doing a SEMA show and and people would come up to us and, you know, wow, what is this? What does this do? And, you know, intercooler upgrades. And by then you had quite a few cars coming out of Japan that were turbocharged. The Starion, the Mirage, uh, you know, the Toyota Supra, the first generation mm -hmm. of that. And the MR2, there was a supercharged version and, and th you know, the Nissan 300 um, ZX and I guess that's what it is. I can't even remember exactly. But, <laughs> yeah, you know, and and so we had you know the staged upgrade parts. I mean, the, you know, HKS was the company that invented the staged upgrade. It wasn't Cobb or any company like that. I mean, yeah. you did it back then. And and you know, stage one was an FCon, and and then you went to an exhaust and an intercooler and went up from there. And so it was just wild. I mean, things were really going crazy i mean it was fcons turbo timers and 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 uh, even metal head gaskets and just you know very similar to what they have now but it was just you know 25 30 years mm -hmm. ago so and, at at hks so you were working as a like a sales position though right like that yeah, was so you were was selling still, parts to or finding dealers and selling parts or going direct to consumers deal. No, no, we didn't sell direct to consumer. We had dealers, and, and so we had dealers on the East Coast and West Coast. So I was technical sales and and did sales support, and uh, would go out and visit the dealers and 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 walk them through why these parts are better and more expensive, and and um, you know, and and just support the company that way. And there were engineers in place already from Japan, and um, uh, that they would. One of the challenges we had at that time were uh, the cars were very different, the Japanese uh, spec cars versus the cars sold in Japan. Hmm. I'm sorry, the cars sold in, in the States. States. Yeah. So, so exhaust systems were different. Catalytic converters were in different positions and so on and so on. And so we'd have to re-engineer the parts for U.S. cars. So, 
they'd send over the Japanese parts and they'd cut, modify, weld, whatever they need to do to make it fit, send the prototypes back to Japan, and then eventually the production parts would come through. So it was very, you know, it was a very good learning experience for, you know, working for an international company at a young age and, and uh, just really learning the industry. But, it, you know, that industry and that, and that genre, this genre of the industry, if you want to call it, this, you know, the four-cylinder import type performance was mm-hmm. really in its infancy. That if you think before that, I mean, you had what imports did you really have in, or small, even domestic force? So you had the Pinto. Okay, well – you know, that's really yeah. not fine. You had the Vega, um, you know, and everything else was an import. You had, the, you know, the Mercury Capri or Ford Capri was from Germany. And then you had all the Japanese stuff. But really the Japanese cars up until the CRX um, and the first generation RX-7, and I guess maybe you could say the Toyota Supra, there really weren't a performance Japanese car sold in the States. Mm-hmm. I mean, we Skyline or anything like that. No, we, didn't so, get, we didn't get that one. Yeah, we didn't get all the cool cars, as they say. But at that time, they were finally starting to come in. And so that market was really in its infancy. And um, so we worked a lot with – there was a magazine back then called Turbo Magazine, which really was huge. And, it, you know, they own that that category of the market. It's, you know, four-cylinder turbos. You know, if you weren't in Turbo Magazine, it, you know, you weren't anything because Road and & Track and, you know, all of the other – you know, so-called buff magazines, they, they didn't care about this stuff. And um, so, you know, it was just, it was great. I mean, we, we did a lot, we learned a lot and, you know, it was, a, it was, it was, it was really good times. And, and I think, you know, for me, it, it's, it was, HKS is quite a prestigious brand now. I mean, people know of it and, and think, you know, the, the products are quality and, and, um, you know, it was, it really looked good on the resume, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Long and um, so, you know, I I think probably after four or five years, I just wanted more opportunity and and um, we we are actually selling a lot of parts to uh, a gentleman named Rod Millen who was doing rally racing for mm-hmm. Mazda at the time and um, he he um, he was running the three two three GTX which was Mazda's. Which is like their equivalent to an RS, really. And yeah, it was an yeah. all-wheel drive um, a car based on the standard Mazda 323 hatchback. And it had a 1.6. The engine was called the B6 and um, turbocharged. So they were buying a lot of parts for us. And um, they knew the Miata was coming out, although I don't know that a lot of people did then. But so they, they were recruiting. They you know, we want to – we want somebody that ca- can come in and, and help us develop the business. And uh, – uh, so I, 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 you know, I went down and, and we discussed things and I took the job. I mean, it was an opportunity for us or for me that, that, you know, I, I thought yeah, this is kind of a ground floor thing. I, I looked at it as we could, you know, build this business up and, and, um, and, uh, so I left HKS and, and, you know, this was the first generation Miata in HS, as they say, so 89, is when it uh, was when I left at the end of '89, and the cars I guess came out then soon thereafter. But mm-hmm. we developed, you know, exhaust systems and sway bars, and you know, just the usual stuff that you have on that type of car. And um, um, it was and good. That, and, I mean, and that was with uh, uh, Rod Millen's team. Yeah, with Rod okay. Millen again in here in Southern California, because he was running the rallies, the program, and then started the subdivision, doing the performance parts. Yep. Yeah. It's uh, It's just. It's funny because the guests that we had on last week, uh, Mike and Rosie Welch. Uh, Mike worked with Rod. Yeah, um, I know Mike. On, on the on the rally stuff, and so he mm-hmm. uh, he was getting a lot of t- talking a lot about that. And then we actually interviewed uh, Reese Millen here about uh, probably about a year ago because mm-hmm. um, we've raced with him against Pikes Peak. So it's it's amazing how uh, the Millen family has affected the yeah. market. Well, I know Reese quite well. I mean, uh-huh. you know, he used to come around because he still lived in New Zealand at the time, and he'd come up for the summers and. I remember him riding around the shop in his bicycle and skateboarding. I mean, he was a young kid. <laughs> yeah. But, but um, yeah, and, and so, you know, we had the rally side of the business and then the um, the, the road car performance, if you will, and, and um, very busy. I mean, we were doing a lot of stuff with the Miata, and it was, you know, the, the, the Miata was quite revolutionary at the time because, you know, there hadn't been a small, agile sports car for us quite some time uh, in the market. And so, you know, I – 
a lot of products. We, we shifted a lot of products. So we sold direct to consumer and then we had some dealers and, and that business was exciting. Plus, you know, we had the, the motorsport side of the business too. And, and that evolved as well in developing products um, for the 323 because mm-hmm. people raced that globally. So we had suspension parts and engines and, and, and at the time Mazda had a, a lot of Group A parts, which was the FIA uh, category, rally. For that. yeah, rally, and so we we were actually the dealer for that. So bushings and clutches and you know, all the cool stuff that everybody wanted, and uh, so we were shipping that around, and and uh, it was good times. I mean, the Miata was really an interesting car because you know it was you could do a lot with it, and we we had built a really cool concept that was. Um, we put one of the rally car engines in it, the turbocharged rally car engines in the brakes off of the, um, I, I guess it was, uh, what chassis would it have been for the RFC chassis or FD, I guess. I don't even remember, but the big, you know, four piston brakes and, and it made a really cool car that was on <laughs> I bet, yeah. like road and track. And, and, uh, so yeah, it was good. And, and, uh, but yeah, yeah, Mike did, Mike was there and did a lot of the fabrication and, and body work on the, the rally cars and Pikes Peaks cars. And, and, um, you know, it was, it was, again, it was here in Southern California, there is, was, and is so much of that mm-hmm. uh, stuff that it, it's just out there. I mean, I guess, I don't know if it's the talent pool, the weather, or a combination of all of it, but, uh, uh, there's actually quite a few companies in this in that in, in this category of businesses here but um uh, so we did that I, I was i was probably there i guess four or five years and uh, saw an opportunity i saw the market changing a bit um the, you know that's when the suvs were really becoming popular for to just really release the ford explorer um and there was the montero and the trooper and and um and I saw an opportunity. I mean, pe- these were becoming more uh, widespread as, as far as, you know, households, uh, mom and pop were driving. Mm-hmm. It wasn't just a core off-roader. So um, I started a business doing um, selling accessories and off-road products for those. So we had items for Land Cruisers and, and um, you know, like the previously mentioned vehicles, the Montero and, and the Trooper, big brush guards and lights and refracts. And, and so that's all and, like, I mean, it's going to be mail order stuff, right? Yeah, it was mail order. We okay. we actually again published a catalog. This was started pre-internet days, yeah. and um, so that's what you did. You made a catalog and you <laughs> sent it out, and you know you took out ads in the back of magazines, and whether it was Road and Track or Car and Driver or Auto Week or Four Wheeler or whatever, and people saw it and they called in for a catalog or they wrote in for a catalog, and so you know we made a catalog and and uh, it worked quite well. I mean, it was just you know it's became a pretty good business over time and um it was just it was just good times i mean it was very busy and it, the market changed as well as the suvs changed you know they used to be very truck like and they started becoming more and more car like if you will and uh, but today still that market is is very popular i mean you see guys with land cruisers and range rovers and you know the, there's these companies that take the old land cruisers and you know, re- reimagine them, I guess, if you will, with modern engines and that. So it, it was good. I mean, really learned a lot. I mean, that was actually the first business that I had started myself. And, and um, uh, yeah, so it was, you know, I was 27, when, you know, when oh, I started wow. that. Yeah. yeah. I, I, you know, I, I had a, a 64 Volkswagen crew cab. In fact, Mike, that you just interviewed, still has that. He bought it from me. He was talking and, about that. I don't think he was talking positively about it, but uh, he did mention yeah. that. <laughs> <laughs> Why? Well, I, I think it was probably – it got stolen when he owned it and a bunch of stuff <laughs> like that. But he bought it from me, and I, I used that money to start the business. Oh, wow. That was your but seed funny. That was your was seed, seed fund, huh? Seed funny, yeah. Uh, I mean, at the time, it was probably a lot, but definitely not uh, what they're worth now, that's for sure. But it was um, – so yeah, built that business up again. Just no outside investment, just seed money, just bootstrapped it. I mean, just worked hard and had a vision, saw an opportunity, and knew it would work. It was just kind of a gut feeling thing. I mean, you could just—I don't know—I'm one of those types. You know, you can look at something, um, and you can just say, "Yeah, that's going to work. That's not going to work." And luckily, it worked. And um, 
you know, had it up, you know, became a multi-million dollar business as far as revenue goes. And we were selling products all over the world, South America. We were buying products, importing products from Australia, you know, those big, huge front bumpers. Yeah, those and, were probably not cheap to move around. Yeah, no, they'd come, they'd come in a container and, and, uh, it was fun. I mean, you know, so you had like, you had a warehouse space and you had salespeople and the whole nine, huh? Yeah. We had a warehouse in Huntington beach. We had, uh, sales staff, uh, you know, and again, the catalogs and then, um, you know, I, I, the, you know, the websites came out, the internet came out, the web, I guess what, mid nineties, late nineties, I don't even know now. And we built a website and, and, um, did you jump on that pretty quick? Like, would you say you were one of the first ones or you yeah, know, kind of yeah. that you saw? Yeah. I mean, yeah, it was interesting because, you know, I, I remember, you know, going to SEMA and again, that's when the, the, the internet was just the thing and people, oh, are you going to, are you guys going to have a homepage or, you know, it was like, oh, yeah, no, yeah. it was yeah. like, what is this? And uh, yeah, so it, you know. Luckily, we jumped on it right away, and it worked quite well. So we had e-commerce, and it was everything back then was really clunky. I mean, compared to what it is now, and um, you know, it's just it was it was good. It just was very exciting and um, selling these products, and just I, I think for us at the time, I mean, you know, there really wasn't the invasion of um, you know, like the the low quality. And I don't want to say this disp- disparagingly by like Chinese parts, what you would equate. I mean, they were just yeah. that kind of stuff didn't really exist. I mean, um, you know, virtually everything we had was either sourced from that we offered was either, either sourced here in the States or Japan or maybe Australia. But so we always tried to sell a quality parts because, you know, I, going back to my uh, youth in the Volkswagen days, you know, I, I recall that th- at that time, you know, th- if I, I spent money on a good part, a quality part, and it, w- it always performed and lasted. If I went the cheap route and it, it just had issues, they were, you know, the, the parts didn't last and it just, you know, they weren't reliable. So I always wanted in, in the, being in this industry, you know, it's, it's hard to do. Uh, and make a quality part cheaply. It's just impossible to do because you can't have the engineering behind it. You can't have the, the quality of manufacturing behind it or the inspection processes and things like that. And so uh, even to this day with Mountune, I mean, we always strive to sell quality products, even if they cost more, because in the end, they don't cost you more because you're not, you know, you're not just throwing it away a, a year later when it breaks or doesn't perform. And even with that business, the, the Overlander business, I mean, we we always only sold the best, and and um, so it was it was good. I mean, people were just excited to to modify their cars, and it was kind of the same thing. I mean, nobody um, was really doing the, the big brush guards and roof racks and things to 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 you know the Mitsubishi Monteros or the Isuzu Troopers at the time you could get all that stuff for Range Rovers but we wanted to take that look that you would have on a Rover at the time and kind of apply it to the to the Land Cruiser and to the Trooper and yeah. to the Ford the, the Japanese and the the yeah. small compact SUVs yeah. well I guess they were full size SUVs then yes. they'd be considered yeah. tiny now but uh... yeah so that was you know for a brief period of time maybe 8 or 10 years I was out of the hardcore racing and um and uh you know import performance uh while i was at that but uh, in so what was the what was the next step i mean it sounds like you're well, you kind of look or you're it sounds like you're looking for kind of the next thing has been kind yeah, of your process uh, through life so far yeah i mean i'm always looking for an opportunity and um so uh, i got out of the business in 03 and and, and sold it off and was doing um some to some consulting for a while and and uh well let me ask you about that did you did you sell it to a person or to coworkers or you know like how did that how did you get out of that business uh, i had a partner when i okay. started the business and and uh, i sold the balance off to him that my shares to him mm-hmm. and um it was just one of those things where i'd had enough of it and yeah. it was just it's I just didn't want to do it anymore and uh, wanted to try something different. I actually thought about getting completely out of the automotive industry, but it gets, you know, I, I enjoy it a lot. And I, you know, I realized that 
I was actually halfway decent at it and why try and reinvent myself? I mean, I'm not saying you shouldn't if that's the way you want to go, but um, I really enjoy it. And if you enjoy what you do every day, well, that makes things a lot better. You know, if you, if you go to a job or have a career that you're not really passionate about, I guess maybe that works for some people, but it, it would never work for me. I have, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, I can go out and sell refrigerators if I wanted to, but I don't think I could, I mean, that was just, that would be it. I couldn't do it. And, um, and for me, uh, personally, it's important that I enjoy what I do. And um, I, there's, there's, I mean, being in the auto industry, I have to be passionate and enjoy what I'm selling. I couldn't go out and sell parts for a car that that I, I didn't like or I didn't, didn't like. Yeah, didn't didn't want like, to own. <laughs> exactly. I mean, you know, again, not trying to upset the Apple car, but like Chevrolets and Camaros or something. I could never work in that. I could never do that. I, I just couldn't even do it. It wouldn't happen. Couldn't sell parts for it. And I'd rather go work at Starbucks and be a barista <laughs> yeah. because I just couldn't get behind it. So, yeah. Um, so yeah, I was doing consulting and, and uh, I'm into English for it's like Cortinas and things like that. And so I was at a vintage race and I had my Cortina. It's just, it was parked and this, this person came up to me and she goes, oh, well, my husband has a, has a Cortina and he's right over here. So I went and talked talk to him and he, he works for Cosworth. We got to talking and he goes, oh, I work at Cosworth. Well, I said, oh, you probably know a couple of my friends that work over there and flash back again to the 80s. Well, there's two guys that I worked with at, at Russ Collins um, that later on, later went on to work at Cosworth. And I said, well, I know Ken and Tom, they're, they're at Cosworth. And he goes, oh, well, you should come by and visit us someday. And so I did. And, and come to find out they were looking to um, – at Cosworth here in the USA, they mm -hmm. were looking to um, – um, expand their business and do some business development and start selling uh, engine parts and, and parts for the Ford Duratec is what they were working on at the time. And uh, so they asked me to put a business plan together to so they could see what it what it looked like. What, so they what, wanted to take uh, what was what was Cosworth? What did they look like at that point? Like what were they well, selling? Yeah, here in the states, I mean, their their main function in life was to support Champ Car, which was okay. a series that's now gone. And they also did um, over the years they did engines for midget racing and IndyCar racing, which was Champ Car, but then IRL and you know, there's that's a whole other thing. So it was a race support facility. Race support, yeah, yeah. pretty big facility, seventy people, oh, man. seventy eighty people, depending on the season, and engine dynos, build engine builders. Um, Parts parts department to support um, to, to support all these engines, and at the time Ford had released the Duratec, which is you know the the the, the baby brother to your EcoBoost. EcoBoost, yep. Uh, same same t EcoBoost is an evolution of the the Duratec, basic same engine block and everything, and uh, <clears throat> so this engine was. Um, you know, it was in the Ford Focus and the Ford Ranger, and, and at that time, Cosworth was actually owned by Ford Motor Company, and uh, Ford wanted Cosworth to develop the engine for use in mid-level motorsports and, and, and develop a range of products, and so a lot of that was done at Cosworth in England, but naturally, America's a big market, so Cosworth USA wanted somebody to, to do it here, somebody to manage that side of the business, so... Um, I, I was recruited for it, and and, uh, and that's how I got my start at Cosworth, and this was, um, I guess, in 2002, 2003, and so same thing. I mean, we, we had a line of products, and there was opportunity for even more products, and so we started to um, further develop the engine and, and product line more so than what the UK was doing, so we would have different cams and different pistons, and uh, the engine, even to this day, is probably the the most prolific engine, four cylinder engine, in use in motorsports. Um, you know, even here at Mountain, it's a big part of our program. So if you look around, you'll see it in open wheel series. You'll see it in some of the NASA series. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's just it's a really great engine, uh, cost effective effective power plant in multiple displacements so you have two liter 2.3 2.5 and anyways that um 
I worked on that program for quite a while, and it was very exciting. And wrote papers on the Duratec, and and you know, it's it's yeah, things you could do to it, development on it, and and uh, about. I guess it was probably 05 or 06 Ford sold Cosworth along with, you know, the F Jaguar F1 mm-hmm. team yeah. and, and quite a few. They divested themselves of all of these things that they didn't really need. At that time, um, the company was was purchased by a, a venture capital group. Um, but basically what it did was allowed us to, to move beyond the Ford product line. and um, Yeah, because you were that, no longer under that. Umbrella, yeah, correct. We could do other things, yeah. and I saw an opportunity to, um, you know, to, to kind of go back to my original roots there with the Japanese performance, but, um, but you know, with the with the current platforms and uh, Subaru had just released the STI in the states, and I saw, well, you know, this is this is all new, you know, it's not like the Evos that have been out a few years. I mean, this is, you know, yeah, there was the WRX, but. It'd been out for a couple of years already, but the STI was a bigger, better, faster car, Brembo brakes, bigger engine, and much like the RS is to the ST, um, different customer base. People are going to modify it to a further extent. So um, we looked around. We looked at, you know, what what the opportunities were, and uh, I I went to England and I said, look, you know, Cosworth had been doing forged pistons, was famous for forged pistons for years and years and years. And um, I said, well, this is what we should do. We should do forged pistons and, and you know, we can do all these other parts. And they, they kind of really dismissed it. They didn't, they didn't really see the market. Mm-hmm. Um, so I came back to Cosworth here in the States. And we, so we looked at our capabilities, in-house capabilities here at the facility in LA. And what we could do were, um, uh, cylinder. We could do cylinder head development. So <clears throat> we developed a cylinder head for the the, the EJ25, which is the you know the STI engine, the 2.5 liter, which was a CNC ported head, big valves, springs ready to bolt on. And we kind of just modeled that. Really, I mean that 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 already existed. That type of product existed in the V8 world, but it really didn't exist in the Japanese you know so-called tuner world. Mm-hmm. And, and we we did five sets of cylinder heads and we called up we literally just called up a few shops that we saw you know on the internet that were kind of known for super performance and you know, they said we it was crazy the response we had it was just it was like, <laughs> yeah it's just, they, the, the heads sold within an just hour flew off the shelf huh yeah it was like uh oh what did we do here and it just kind of it just went from strength to strength i mean we just started building the heads we found we did cams it just it just really just exploded i mean it was just one of those things that it was just whatever we made people bought and it wasn't because we were you know we weren't making anything gimmicky everything we did actually had a function or solved the problem and that was really the you know the, i think what you need to do if you're making the products you need where, where you're really going to sell the most and 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 get the the biggest market penetration is offering something that solves a problem, um, whether it's a head gasket or, or, or uh, you know, a better a better piston or connecting rod or an oil pan baffle, something that that fixes a problem for guys that are doing track days or just you know high performance, whether it's drag racing or anything. I mean, yeah, more it, power. That's more definitely. power. <laughs> so it just it just went crazy and then you know, we started doing mitsubishi parts yep i remember the and, cosworth head for the mitsubishi or the evo i never had one but uh, yeah. i remember seeing them before yeah so the evo heads evo cams we we were the first out with with the evo 9 cam which was mitsubishi's first venture into mm-hmm. um uh, variable valve var- timing. Var- yeah variable cam timing it was only in the intake but we we're the first company to have that and it was crazy i mean seriously in one year we sold three hundred thousand dollars worth of cams. <laughs> cams. One, one part number i mean yeah. you know and but it, but the the entire performance parts business for cosworth i mean it developed into a you know a, a pretty big business we're talking millions and millions of dollars and you know it was it, you know we guided it out of the u.s side of the company um, the UK side did make pistons for us um, because that was what they could do over there. And, so, were you manufacturing the parts here in the states, or was the 
Well, right. the pistons were made in the UK, okay. so um, obviously the cylinder heads. We were buying brand new castings from Subaru and machining them here. And um, so we'd use partner suppliers, like for valves, we'd either use Supertech or Freya, uh, but everything that we had was made to our spec. We did do some manufacturing in-house, uh, if it was a machine part, because we had machining centers. Um, but <clears throat> one of the our top products uh, were the assembled short blocks. And we were literally selling hundreds of those a year for the for the EJ25 because, um, you know, the original engine was wasn't that robust. And when well, yeah, you, you breathe on it and it falls yeah, apart. So yeah. <laughs> so <clears throat> we were buying brand new engine cases, uh, and you know all of these components from Subaru, and you know putting our touch on it and modifying it. But um, <clears throat> excuse me, we you know we did dry sump systems made in-house. We'd machine the pans from solid aluminum. We'd use an outside, a company that made a pump for us. We did an intake manifold for the three, for the VQ35 and for the EJ and, and some of the other, the Duratex, but designed in-house, actually cast here in LA. I mean, wow. Um, so, you know, and, and that's one of the things too, people think of LA, all, all they make there are movies. No, it's not true. I mean, the manufacturing resources here, in Southern California are enormous. I mean, you can get stuff plated, machined, cast, forged, whatever you want. It's all available here because of the aircraft industry. Yep. I mean, that's why SpaceX is here. I mean, they have those resources are incredible. Um, so yeah, we have a pretty big product line and, uh, you know, it just, it was just, we were selling all over the world. Uh, it was, it was very exciting times. We, we, we had a huge distributor in Singapore. So I was going over there all the time and they were selling out throughout Asia, um, back and forth to England all the time because I'd support the, the, the UK side of the business with the parts. And, um, it was great. Yeah, it's, it's very interesting. You know, I mean, you always hear of like, JDM, you know, like the, it's got to be JDM kind of stuff. But then you've got this, I mean, very large English company with an American base <laughs> that's like manufacturing and selling stuff uh, back overseas, <laughs> like the other direction. Um, yeah, it's so. true. I mean, people, people were, you know, I think very surprised when they found out a lot of these parts came from the U.S. side of the business. And, um, but, you know, I mean, it, that was fine. It didn't really yeah, matter where yeah. it came from. I mean, it's – I think you're going to start seeing that here, that same type of thing with Mountain. But in the end, I mean, you know, at, at Cosworth, it was great. I mean, we, we had a great team there. And, um, you know, the performance part side of the business was – actually got to a point um, probably when, you know, like around 2010, 2011 when Champ Car um, – ceased to exist. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was, it was pretty, it was actually supporting the U S business here for Cosworth. And, um, so, you know, it was just designing those parts, coming up with new opportunities is, you know, when you really need to look at that, I mean, you see, again, you go back to where, you know, what are customers having issues with? Are they, you know, well, the Subaru, the stock block was, you know, only good to say five or 600 horsepower. So we were looking at casting up a new block. Unfortunately, it never happened, but um, we were always looking for things like that. When it's kind of the same mentality we're putting forth with the Focus ST, Focus RS. So trying to find, you know, the weak spots and, and uh, enhance, you know, or come up with enhancements to fix that. But, um, you know, and so I was there, I guess, uh, probably. 10 or 12 years at Cosworth and um, I left there in 2012 and actually went to work for Cobb, Cobb Tuning uh, for a while. I, I, Trey actually, Trey Cobb actually t called me when he found out that I, the same day that he found out that I left Cosworth and said, <laughs> you know, awesome. do you, yeah, do you want to, do you want to come down? Do you want to do something with Cobb? And at the time I was doing a lot of international business development for Cosworth. We, like I said, we had a big distributor in um, Singapore and we had some stuff going on in Australia and China and, and Cobb was looking, was very interested in um, expanding that side of the business. And uh, so we, you know, we did a deal and I worked there for a while. It was great. Cobb was a, you know, Cobb's a machine. I mean, that, that, that company makes great products and, uh, you know, 
it's it's a great product line. The Axis Support definitely supports, uh, you know, that uh, that company, and and uh, and it should. I mean, it's there really isn't anything that touches it still. I mean, in the in in our category of cars, I mean, there's other devices for domestics that may, you know, may be just uh, as popular, if not more popular. But um, you know, it's I, I think for Americans, we we like to have something tangible. So to to have your car just go to a place and have it flashed, it's hard for us, I think, to grasp that. We want to walk away with something in our hands. Yeah, and the access yeah. port does that. Yeah. And, you know, it gives you options where you have the gauges and everything else. But um, so I was there um, uh, for a year, year and a half, and I was actually at Autosport, um, which is English, or England's and Europe. The Europe's uh, performance show, kind of like SEMA, cross between SEMA and PRI. So you okay. get uh, hardcore stuff, street stuff, but it's it's a pretty good show. And and uh, I was I had a meeting with Mountain because I was uh, trying to sell them the access ports. Oh, and gotcha. Yeah. Remember, I was international business. So, yeah, that was it. Yeah. Uh, and and David Mountain, the founder of Mountain, hints. Um, the name and Mountain and Mountain. He came up to me and we started talking and and uh, he laughed and he goes, "Oh, is this the same Ken Anderson that was uh, uh, killing me at at Cosmo?" Because I was at, you know, <laughs> yeah. at the time Mountain was doing the Ford Duratec parts and and so were we at Cosmo. So Cosmo, yeah. Said, yeah. So we were we laughed and so we had the meeting. Anyways, he goes, "You know, do you know Mountain wants we want to be in the states because Ford is going to start selling the the ST and." product line there and or is and and um and soon they're after the rs and you know do you know anybody that can help us and i raised my hand i said i speak british <laughs> yeah. so it's it makes makes sense and uh it was just for me it was i wanted a challenge um that i wasn't getting at cobb because cobb was already such a well-established you know pretty big company um you know, again, nothing against. It. I love you know, and we still, I still talk to those guys all the time. I mean, we we're you know one of their bigger dealers, and um, it just, it just wasn't for me. I wanted something that I could sink my teeth into and be a part of, and and uh, so we put together a deal, and we opened up, um, we opened up Mount Tune USA, and in 2013, uh, we had a small office in uh, Orange County here in Southern California, and we chose to be small at first because. We just weren't sure how the Ford relationship um, was going to pan out here in the States and how it would compare to how Mountain, um, how the relationship was in Europe. And that meaning, you know, was Ford going to accept the product line in the States for warranty approval or how much were they going to buy? What, you know, what could that support as a business? And so um, we started off relatively small. It was just me for the first almost a year. Um, so I was doing everything, selling, yeah, so making the website, shipping products, and um, which was fine. I mean, you know, just doing what had to be yeah. done. I didn't care. I mean, it was just because I saw the opportunity. And uh, interestingly enough, too, back at Cosworth, I mean, we knew there was going to be a Focus ST. Um, and we had started looking at doing that product line, but again, you know, that whole, that whole Cosworth thing is kind of faded away. So, um, yeah, you don't hear much about them. I mean, you really don't hear much about them anymore. I mean, they're still making components, but, uh, yeah, it just doesn't seem that they have as, I uh, mean, I mean, you left, what would you want, you know, why'd you do that? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you know, it those things happen, happens. but yeah. <laughs> so how uh, long, how long had Mountain do you happen to know when they were started? I mean, it's, yeah, a, well, Dave, it's a big David company. Start, yeah, David started the company in 1980. He, um, uh, and the the first thing that Mountain that he did, they they were building A series engines, British Line Line A series, which is the engine in the the Mini Cooper, the original Mini Cooper, okay. the old Mini Cooper, and which you know you can imagine in England is like small block Chevy, yeah, and yeah. Um, so building building tons of those race engines and that and and. Um, David still he's still with the companies. He's um, technical director, and he still he has a Mini Cooper, a racing Mini Cooper. <laughs> but um, you know he was he was building those. And, and Ford, how how it started was um, with Ford is uh, in about 1985, Ford released the the Cosworth Sierra, which again another car that we didn't get here, but very similar to the Mercor XR4 Ti. And uh, that the engine that was in that car, the the Sierra, was called the the YB, and it was a two-liter twin-cam turbo. And 
he had built uh, one of those engines uh, for uh, a guy named Carlos Sainz, which is a pretty famous uh, rally driver, um, and especially back then was just getting started. And he built his Recce car engine, which is the car they go out and do pace notes in a rally. And so Carlos came back to Ford and he said, you know, this engine's great. I want it in my rally car. So they put it in the rally car and he won some significant rally. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Might have been the Monte Carlo or something. And so after that, uh, Ford Ford Racing or Ford Motorsport in, in Europe calls up David and says, hey, you know, we want you to build – uh, Carlos's engines. Can you do that? And he goes, no. He goes, but I'll build all of your engines. And they said, okay, you can build all <laughs> <Deal>. of your engines. <laughs> well, there you go. And so he 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 tells the story. He goes he goes back to the workshop and tells everybody, throw all that Mini Cooper stuff in the trash. We're building Ford engines from yeah. here on. We just made a a hundred fold increase yeah. in our demand here. <laughs> yeah. So you know, it just it just went crazy. I mean, the company. Um, I mean, was the the the, the dominant uh, Ford uh, works engine building company for four cylinder turbo uh, and rally and touring cars for years and years. Uh, you know, they did, you know, Colin McRae, and it just the list goes on and on. So, mm -hmm. uh, uh, Sierra Cosworth engines, whether it was t British touring car, uh, European touring car. I mean you know, Australian Bathurst, whatever series that is. I mean, they were just building engines also for rally. So they did that for the Cosworth Sierras, the, um, the Escort Cosworths. And then, you know, fast forward to the, when the Focus came out. So Mountain developed the, the Z-Tech WRC engine that McCollum McRae run this, uh, McRae won the Safari rally. And I guess it would have been 99. And um, it just, you know, the company has just been with doing Ford four-cylinder turbo stuff for years. Now, at that same time, the company was also doing many other things. I mean, there was there was development for uh, Audi engines at the time, Honda okay. engines at the time. But it's you know it's just really known for the Ford side of the business. Kind of how Cosworth people a lot of times people think Ford Cosworth, but Cosworth still did a lot of stuff for General Motors and many other companies. So same with Mountain, but um. So yeah, a lot of, and when I say engine development, I'm you know I'm talking every, anything from pistons to completely new cylinder heads. I mean it's just quite yeah. a quite a you know, range of uh, high level engineering. And, that is super cool. <laughs> I, you know yeah. I really don't know the history of a lot of the compact stuff. I started my life doing domestics and then didn't get into compacts until college. So mm -hmm. it's you know and and essentially you know especially on a global scale you know, how far reaching some of these companies were is, is still pretty baffling. Um, yeah. I mean, it, it's, you know, so mounting, you know, selling engines here, even here in the States, but a lot of stuff in Australia, naturally Britain and Europe and, um, uh, Southeast Asia. So a lot of customers in Malaysia and Singapore and Indonesia that race, uh, you know, the, the, the cars at the time, whether it was a Escort or a, you know, a Sierra and, and, uh, or a Focus WRC. So Mountain was building the engines for M Sport at the time. So any of the WRC focuses that, that, uh, the M Sport ran, um, you know, had a, had a Mountain engine. And, um, yeah. And so still to this day, I mean, we do tons and tons of, uh, now it's mostly rally cross. That's the big thing. So we do global rally cross engines. We do global rally cross engines for Ford. We do uh, Honda's uh, global rally cross mm -hmm. engine. We build that engine. We do. Um, there's other things we can't mention, but we <laughs> have, you know, all the way from the six and seven hundred horsepower supercar engines all the way down to the uh, the lights engines, which is a Duratec, uh, two point five liter Duratec. So um, so we do those. Uh, both now here in the states and and back in England, and uh, we it, we just supplied a, a series out of that runs out of India. Um, a oh, formula, <laughs> I think it's Formula Three uh, Asia, and so there's probably fifteen or twenty uh, open wheel cars. You know, they look like yeah. little F1 cars, and they all run a two liter Duratec, yeah. two hundred and fifty horsepower Duratec. So that it's you know where anybody that needs a uh, you know, a, a four cylinder engine. I mean, we can help them out. We do, um, you know, complete 
we can design an engine from scratch, which in England they call bespoke or, or clean sheet design. Mm -hmm. We can modify factory engines. And um, so it's, it's, um, it's when I, you know, I knew, of course, the history of Mountain being in the industry yep, for years. Yep. And so I, that's why I saw this as an opportunity because for me, you know, I saw the, the, the big opportunity at first selling the, the streetcar parts like for our RS and ST. And when I see that, you know, of course, that was that product line was already pretty stable. But if you can back it up with motorsport heritage and motorsport DNA, I mean, that's even better. It's a great oh, yeah. market. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's a, that's a really big one to not have to just come to the market with, hey, guys, yeah. trust me. You know, yeah. I mean, like that's really hard to do. But uh, yeah, okay, and so. Have 35, 36 years of that. I mean, it's, you know, it's pretty yeah, powerful. It's a good trusted brand, at least globally. So it makes it a yeah. little easier to transition here. But uh, yeah, so take take us back. And um, so you were saying you, it was just you at Mountain with mm -hmm. an office <laughs> somewhere. Um, and so kind of walk us through, you know, how are you, what, what you did to build that business into what it is today. Well, so we set up the business. Um, you know, and then and it's it's the business is owned by myself, and then the, the UK side. So there's multiple partners in it, and so we set it up as a an, an LLC, as advised by our tax attorneys and and that. And um, it was pretty basic. I mean, you know, we we knew we needed a website, so I built the you know the the website, um, which isn't that difficult this day and age. But do you have you know, a coding background? Like, did you no, actually build it, or did you hire no, somebody? No, no. I mean, it? no, no, no. I mean, you, you when you use a when you build a website now, they're templates, and you yeah, just yeah. pretty much just drag and drop. I mean, um, the, that's how the initial. And naturally, it's as the company's developed, we do have outside help with the website. But initial website was, uh, you know, just to get us up and running mm -hmm. with e-commerce and. Uh, and so the relationship that we had at the time, the deal we did with Ford in the States was that Mountain sold to – we could sell direct to the consumer, but Ford had wholesale distribution rights of our products. And that was a three-year agreement, which has since expired, but we're still working with them. Um, but we knew that um, – well, we knew there would be – interest in the products for sure because even before Mountune had set up here in the states Mountune in the uk received quite a few uh, inquiries from potential customers here yeah, and consumers yeah. here that one of the products right because they saw the uh, Mountune was had already been involved with the original focus rs yep, and yep or the Mark II, um, and then also the ST, and had a huge range of products, and it was only a natural. So, um, so we knew there'd be demand. So, and when did the ST hit the states? Uh, I want to say June, June of 2013 okay. was the, and then a year later, the or oh, I guess about a half a year later, the Fiesta came out. Okay, so and he, uh, I mean, you started the company, or did you start the company? Before I before it hit the states, like get it on the uh, get it running. No, I think it was about the same time. About the same, okay, I mean, gotcha. Yeah, because we started it in June of 2013, so okay, yeah, nearly four years ago. <clears throat> it was about the same time. I don't, just give or take a month. Okay, or so. gotcha. Yeah, but and, there was some foresight that it was coming to the U.S. to at well, least get the ball rolling. Yeah, because I had already talked to to Mountune, you know, six months early, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, at the end of 2012, beginning of 2013. I mean, and people that already knew it was coming. I mean, yep. Ford had announced it. Okay. And um, so we knew it was coming. And same type of thing, though. Do you know, you know, we obviously the UK side didn't have access to a US car at first. So were the parts going to work? Or, you know, so yeah, yeah. We, we, we bought a car and yes, everything worked. The first thing with Ford, though, because um, the ST kits were, uh, quote unquote, warranty approved, even though mm -hmm. it's such a term. But so we had to have CARB, uh, California Air Resources Board, um, exemption on the parts. Yeah. So we, we had to do the testing and, and, you know, that takes a while. That could take two weeks. It could take three months. It just depends on you're dealing with the government agency. Mm -hmm. So we had to get that done before, um, Ford would even sell the product line. So that finally came through. And um, so anyways, things started move, moving at the beginning of 2014. And, and uh, <clears throat> Ford, you know, they were promoting the product through uh, Ford Performance. And you could buy the product through the dealers or through their catalogs. Um, 
And uh, then again, we were selling direct to consumers. Um, so it was just, you know, we were selling product parts. It was, we were quite busy and for, with the Focus ST and Focus RS RS and, and I mean, Fiesta ST mm -hmm. and uh, trying to add more and more products because, you know, consumers were requesting things that Mountain didn't have at the time. And you'd be amazed too, that when you, when you deal with this kind of stuff on, uh, international level how different the customers are from region to region in america um <clears throat> i would say the customers are a bit more hardcore than than maybe they are in europe for the most part and i think that has to do with the cars here are phenomenally cheaper okay uh, than uh than uh, the same car in your room well, and maybe not the window sticker but the cost of ownership so fuel's a lot more there mm -hmm. and insurance is more things like that and so many people here have multiple cars you know you may have an rs and this and that where over there maybe not so i mean if you're if you have an rs or an st it's your only car you, you know in your daily car so you don't want to get too crazy with it so where I'm going with this is customers wanted bigger, more, more power and, and, uh, big, you know, big turbos and things like that. So we, we started, um, we saw that opportunity. So I recruited people and <clears throat> we started growing the business. So adding engineers allowed us to, uh, to answer the customer's demand with mm -hmm. products that Mountain UK didn't necessarily, um, want to make or have the ability to make or didn't see the potential so you know it's it's still to that 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 way today i mean um you know we we we've been selling a big turbo kit for the focus st now for probably over a year and they haven't even launched one in the uk side wow. because our our customers here want it they want it and the other guys it, you know uk it, guys they're like yeah i'm okay yeah, and and uh, so and and that's fine. I mean, that's that's fine because customers are different globally, like I said, and um, so yeah, just really fine fine tuning the business to the market and the region, and you know that takes time, um, <clears throat> but you know we saw that it had to be done, and and uh, so same with the RS. I mean, we're looking at different options for that. People here want built engines. Maybe not so much in the UK right now, and that may change too as the cars become older and kind of move downstream a bit. But here, um, yeah, and you guys, you guys had a you had a display built engine. I guess it was pretty close to a could be a real yep. thing, but uh, at yep. PRI this year, so I went and oogled yep. at it for a while. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's uh, we actually have we've we have three of them in right now uh, in our engine build shop here at our facility in Carson, California. We've got. Um, I mean, the interest in that has been pretty strong mm -hmm. already because people are, are are really going to push the limits of the factory engine pretty quick, and so um, we saw that. We knew that it kind of goes back to that model that we had a Cosworth with the um, with the the STI. Mm -hmm. um, you know, customers aren't going to be satisfied with 400 or 500. You know, they want 500. Well, yeah, okay, that's fine, but then you have <laughs> this and that, and so. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, I mean, as far as mounting goes, I mean, that's where we're at. I mean, so here in the States now, we're up to, I guess, 13 people. Wow. And, and uh, so the last, this last year when we moved into the newer facility, which I believe you visited here yep. probably yep. a few months ago. Yeah, so we, this facility, we, we, we've been here just, uh, um, just over a year. So, you know, it took us some time to develop. So we have our engine dyno in here now, build shop, engineers, and um, they laugh because actually half the staff are ex-Cosworth here. <laughs> the, the UK side of the business laughs and says, yeah. Ken, Ken's getting the band back together. Yeah, but yeah. in reality, I mean, it works out great because, you know, these guys know what I want. They know the business. They know how I work. And again, being from Cosworth, they speak British too, so they know how to deal with it. And you'd be surprised. I mean, it's just, it is different because we all speak English, do not do not assume that it's the same because it's, <laughs> it's not. the same. It's not. Yeah. They have and some it, different not, curse words and you don't, well, they're not yeah, surprised yeah. here. I'm not saying it's bad or good. It's just, it is what it is. I mean, we, we, we joke with each other all the time and, you know, many of us go back and forth. I mean, I'm in England probably a total of almost two months a year, just 
if you totaled up all the back and forth and yeah. our, as yeah. we try to send <clears throat> you know a couple of the people over every every year just uh you know it's good to go over there and see how things are done and the same thing they come over here and spend a week or so and um you know because we do there are a lot of you know there is a lot of crossover as far as products um on the on the uh you know when you talk about the base product line but um but, you know, the facility here has worked out quite well for us um yeah it's got i mean you got a beautiful showroom with thank you, you know, a yeah, car in there and all kinds of other yeah. stuff so yeah i mean it was kind of i wanted something different when we put it together i said i didn't want this, the typical tuning shop um you know oh black black leather clout couches exactly. with uh with a tv like my <laughs> that like my waiting room is <laughs> well, i mean that's fine but i just yeah yeah it's a little you know it's generic generic display case and that works but i you know i wanted something that where people could come in and we actually change it up quite often we, we've added some stuff to the back and um, we have a lot of meets here now where people really like to come in and hang out and um but uh, yeah, I wanted a little bit of heritage and, and then the new stuff. So we have some old, you know, we've got some old F1 engine cam covers and things like that. But, you know, it's just, it's, it's worked out well. This location is, it was perfect for us. And, um, and uh, we're actually, I think since you've been here, we're, we're running out of space. I mean, already it's with the, with the RS and some of the other things we're working on now that um, as far as warehouse space and, and, and installation, I mean, it's just, we are so busy, especially with the RS doing installations. I mean, we're doing two or three a day now upgrades and, and, um, uh, it's, it's, it's great. Don't get me wrong, but I mean, yeah, it it's, does see, I have seen that, um, I, personally, I feel like a lot of people are modifying the cars, um, I mean, it's pretty basic stuff. And the, the good part was it's a lot of it is shared with the Mustang. You know, when the, like, I remember when the Evo 10 came out, everybody was excited, but then it was so different that like nobody knew what to do. And yeah. like cams were a disaster. It was pr pretty hectic there in the beginning, a couple years to really get the car going. But I mean, I've already seen several people uh, just deciding on their own to do a built motor with yeah. the RS, you know, not blowing it up, you know, not have not having to. They're like, yeah, I want mm -hmm. a big, big power, and I want to put a turbo on it, and auxiliary fuel from the ST fit like immediately, you know. So mm -hmm. it's been uh, it's been pretty amazing. So you know that I can understand you guys doing a lot of installs on the car, and I have seen it. It seems like most of the people are doing modifications because we do. I've installed several um, intercoolers and pipes and intakes. Well, not intakes, but you know. Uh, mm -hmm. exhaust and wastegates and you know lots of people are doing the e30 so it seems like the market is fairly strong for a performance car that costs 35 to forty thousand dollars. so i've been pretty happy with it yeah but i mean i don't think that's more than an sti is it? no it's the exact same price yeah, yeah the evo 10 yeah. and the sti are the same price so yeah. yeah and it was only a matter of time and, and you're right i mean people are modifying it and and it's you know we have really um two basic types of cars you've got the guy that I don't want to do anything unless it's warranty approved or, you know, backed by Ford. And then you have the guys, I don't care. I just want power. <laughs> I, I would say there's probably 80% of the people don't care about the warranty. I mean, that's yeah, what it no, feels like yeah, to me. I've seen very, I haven't seen anybody that yeah. seems to care that much, but I, I kind of wanted to touch on that. And so you mentioned earlier about the CARB certification, the California Air Resources Board. Um, you know, it's obviously been a hot topic for performance shops um, with what the EPA kind of taken a little bit more aggressive stance on it in 2016. Um, mm -hmm. Is it is it true that you guys, all of your products are CARB certified or do you have specific ones that are that you can sell or how does that work? Yeah, well, definitely not everything we have is and some things that don't need to be. Um, but for the ST, we have um, upgrades that are CARB certified, mm -hmm. whether it's Focus or Fiesta. But obviously, you can only go to a certain power level and still ha have it remain CARB uh, and Ford legal. So, um, yeah, we have you know a, a wide range of products, whether it's an intake or a specific power upgrade. Um, we are also working on that for the RS. So we actually have several things in in 
in with CARB right now for the RS that should be out in the next, well, hopefully we'll get the exemption information in the next, uh, I guess it is February as of today, but later this month. And so there will be a 380 horsepower um, CARB EO upgrade. And then there's also going to be one that we're working on with Ford uh, that they will offer under their brand um, that will have a different power level. Mm-hmm. Um, that that will offer. Um, I'm not sure the price or anything like that on theirs, but um, yeah, so, it's yeah. pretty cool to come from the factory with you know they're backing it. Now they're it's a reduced uh, warranty period, isn't it? Uh, you know, it, it is it and it isn't. So what? And I don't know if this has happened, but when they when Ford originally did that, their warranties were like three and thirty six, you know, for a brand new vehicle, and mm-hmm. then later on it went to five, whatever it is, sixty, and so. But the Ford performance warranty had never changed to match that, and we had talked to them end of last year, and they had they had considered or were considering changing their Ford performance warranty to match the factory. Oh, okay. So they just didn't yeah. change it. <laughs> it yeah. wasn't like half. It's just like, oh, no, no, no. It's just, <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, and, and that's all it was, but to be honest, I mean, you know, with, with our upgrades that we've done with them, we've never had one issue, one failure, anything, no warranty claims at all. So I don't think it's so much of an issue. It's more, it's really about for me anyways, if I was at that, that type of consumer, I just want it on the car. So if I go into the dealer for other things, they're not going to hassle you. Yeah, yeah. And um, so, yeah, I mean, we're, we're selling those. We've we've been selling them in Europe, um, uh, you know, f- since last year when the car first came out. So we have, um, the, what I think they're calling it the FP375, the Ford Performance um, 375 upgrade. Now, in, in Europe, you know, there is no carb, so they could – it didn't have they to do be whatever, carb certified. Yeah. Okay. And then we had to wait for the cars to become available in the States. Then before you give the car to carb, it has to have 4,000 miles on it. So there was that stack up of time. Oh, man, so, you should have given it to me. I, I yeah. think I got that in like three weeks. I think you did, <laughs> yeah. So finally, we, we had a, a test date uh, right before Christmas break and – um. So, yeah, that's it's all the testing's been done. We've got the results. It's passed. All the paperwork's been submitted. So it will happen. It's not going to be too much longer. So we'll have an option. And, you know, to, what I say in this market, it's really the consumers. It's a good time for the enthusiast, the consumer, because there, there are so many um, options available to them. If they want to go and stay warranty compliant, bam, that's going to be available to them. If they want to go big turbo, bam, that's that's going to be mm-hmm. that's that's in the cards. Well, it's already exists for ST, RS. It will happen. You know, if they want to do big cams, whatever. I mean, they're you know, it's whatever you want to. We, we're talking with Quaif right now. They're going to have a sequential five speed for the RS and ST Focus ST. You know, if you want to spend, I guess it might be eight or nine thousand dollars. Sure. But I did. I did see a picture of that. That is going to be cool pretty cool. Yeah. <laughs> and, and again, I mean, it's 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 to me, it, you know, having these cars first of all from Ford, um, and then whether you're buying Mountain or Cobb or whoever, it doesn't matter. It's options. I mean, we we're not we're not fools here at Mountain. We know people may not want to buy everything that we have. The sure mm-hmm. people like to mix and match. There's tons of other brands out there. We we don't. You know, we just ask that, you know, if you're going to make a part, make something original. Don't copy ours. And that's all we care. And, and you know, and I think that's a fair, you know, <laughs> a fair requ- yeah, request. Yeah. And and um, do you so, happen to have patent protection on any of your stuff? Are you guys going after, um, you know, like utility patents or design patents? No, it's kind of we, tough, though. Yeah, we've looked at it and, and it's it's relatively expensive. And you just, I mean, it, you know. It's important to remember this market that we're in. Well, you know, it's it's a great business, but it's not. We're not talking Apple level of businesses here, yeah. revenue here. I mean, yeah. So, you know, are you? You may sell a, a thousand. Yeah. Ever yeah. Or something. Exactly. You're you're exactly right. So if you think you know, uh, they're going to make twenty five thousand RSs globally. You know, and typically in this industry, people, you know, assume people, you'll get 10% of market penetration. Yeah. Well, I think you'll get more on the RS just because it's an RS. But um, 
So, you know, it, it, for us here at Mountain, whether it's in the UK or here, you know, we just take the car, we look at it. What do we want? You know, what are the initial products we need to make? Obviously, intakes and intercoolers. And then, you know, we start going back. What else can we do? What else does it need? What are we seeing in our car? What are we seeing on the engine dyno? What, what's breaking? What's not breaking? And, and just, you know, create, again, create these products that solve issues. Um, so, you know, and that's, that's how we develop the product line. Yeah. Very cool. So with the building that you're in, are you guys renting that space? Yeah, we, we did a, a lease and actually, um, we're trying to get, there's a building in the back uh, of this compound that we're trying to get to now, just because it's, uh, it's, it's quite busy. We have, um, two other product lines that we're going to start selling out of this facility. So we've been, um, there's a line of Subaru per performance parts out of the UK called Roger Clark Motorsport or RCM. And they, they are quite famous in Europe. They have a very fast time attack car called the Gobstopper. That's okay. That, that holds, for example, holds the record, uh, up, up the Goodwood festival of speed hill climb. It is it that, is it like blue and white and black? It's black and or white, black and red. It's got okay. massive wings on it, so it, it it's like faster than the McLaren. Yeah, yep. people. Yeah. So, anyways, we we know those guys. I've known them from the Cosworth days, and they want to be in the states, and they make some really trick stuff that's like you know dry sumps and hardcore mm -hmm. stuff. They wanted a, a, a you know us to help them sell the products in the states and. You know, again, since many of us are ex Cosworth, many of us speak a little bit of Subaru language here too, so mm -hmm. it's it kind of made sense. And then we're also um, we work with Piper Cams quite a lot. Again, another really a company that's been around since the '60s, and um, and you know they want uh, more market penetration in the states. So we have PiperCamsUSA.com coming here pretty quick, and wow. where we're going to sell their entire product line and not just the Ford products. And uh, so another great company, though. I mean, they do development work for F1 teams and and many companies that you know Ricardo Engineering and things like that that create. The, the engines that you drive that you know in your rs i mean they're it's a quite a great engineering company so and so you're gonna have a are you gonna have an ownership stake in those companies as well no 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 we're just we're just sharing facilities products. yeah okay mm -hmm. so helping them sell the products in the states because it's you know for americans you know we, we we're lazy we don't like to get stuff from overseas typically if you can buy it here in the states it makes it easier you can get the products in a few days and customer services on you know your time zone not eight hours different so it just <laughs> yeah. makes sense to have this stuff here so you know it's this this facility's worked out great but um you know and it was definitely a little bit bigger than uh, when we, when i first found it it was like wow we're really gonna need this space but it's worked out well so oh very cool uh, well uh let's take a break uh just here real quick to uh hear about our sponsor we all know owning a shop is difficult, so we created My Shop Assist to help you manage the various jobs. Whether you run a machine shop, a performance tuning shop, build off-road trucks, or even do powder coating, My Shop Assist can help you. It is completely online and will help you schedule the jobs, log time on each task, track parts orders, and take pictures of the work. You can even export your jobs from My Shop Assist into QuickBooks as invoices. So if you're interested to improve operations at your shop, check out MyShopAssist.com to start your 30-day free trial. Okay, well, we're back with uh, Ken Anderson, again, with uh, Mountune USA. And so I kind of want to get, um, kind of shift gears here a little bit. We've heard lots of good stuff. Um, I want you to kind of explain to us what's kind of the worst experience you've had in business, like something that you struggled with or, you know, an unforeseen problem that you've had, you know, growing it, really any of the businesses. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, how did you overcome that? Well, I think as a business owner and, and uh, whether you're an owner or, you know, a high-level manager, I, I, th things happen that are out of your, your control. Those are always really bad to, because you, there's really not much you can do with them. One example might be 9-11. I remember, um, you know, when that happened, I uh, just like, wow, what is this going to do, you know, to the business? Well, it, it actually hurt the business quite a lot mm -hmm. back in – uh, when I when I had that SUV business and you know you can't stop that from happening. I mean, um, you know at Cosworth when we had um, uh, 
the Great Recession. I mean, gosh, you know, you didn't see that coming either. And, you know, you, the stock market falls how many points in one day? I mean, mm -hmm. What can you do? But it really does affect the business. Those are things like that are really hard to predict. Um, you know, otherwise, I mean, I think, uh, you know, when you're in business, there's challenges every day uh, that you just need to face. And I th as you as you become older and wiser and have more experience, you learn how to deal with those challenges and 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 understand that some of them may seem really big on the surface, but they really aren't that big. And you know, it, dealing with um, Things like insurance companies and, and, and you know, <laughs> just things like, that you think, well, you got to spend money on this, this, these services. Yeah, it's just, it is what it is. You just, that's, you, there's nothing you can do about it. And uh, you do need to, to have that stuff. But I think, uh, you know, there's, it's just a lot of challenges that build up and that you just deal with, you, you know take them on as you as you as they come at you and um, I wouldn't say I mean looking back over the years I mean it's just things like that 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 are I guess out of your control or are the most frustrating um, when you're when you're trying to build a business I mean you know you think as an entrepreneur you think you know you're always looking at the bright side of things because you you know you're an optimistic person generally entrepreneurs are you're looking for opportunities you can do anything right and so I, I think it's important to step back from time to time and kind of regauge where you're at and look at, you know, maybe revisit some of these challenges that that you've that have come about and and really maybe tackle them when you have a better mindset mm -hmm. or the business is in a different position. Um, you know, California brings a lot of challenges themselves just being here. I mean, we have, you know, the cities have many different ordinances and luckily the this the area that we're in is um, classified as uh, heavy industrial. So we're okay with a lot of the things we do. But, um, you know, you, you talk to, I talk to colleagues that have businesses in other parts of Southern California that aren't so so fortunate. So that was one of the, the, the uh, the things that I wanted to consider when looking for this building is is making sure that we could do what we needed to do and wouldn't be dealing with city inspectors or other you know uh, agencies in in the, as we grew the business and um, you know I I just think that again that type of thought pattern I guess comes with time and, mm -hmm. and maturity. Yeah, experience of doing yeah. it many many times yeah. yeah. Yeah, and you guys are – I mean, they built that Porsche racing school like yeah. two miles south of you guys. So <laughs> there's yeah, a, yeah. they'll let you guys do anything out there in that area. Yeah, I mean, you know, that, that you actually where that Porsche place is was a, was a golf course, and right next to it was a federal Superfund site. So it's, oh, boy. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and uh, so, yeah, it's, it's a neat area around here. We've got the Porsche stuff, and many other things are going on, and it's – it's kind of it's it's a cool area. It's worked out quite well for us, and uh, so the location is you know right next to the busiest freeway in the country. So mm -hmm. that helps a lot too. From as you know, out here in LA, it's traffic is pretty bad, so you need to have access to your business. Yes. <laughs> get to it easily. Well, what's something that's got you fired up right now? You know, something that you're really excited about uh, here in the future. Well, I mean, in general, we are you know, excited about the RS and where that's going to go. I mean, that's very exciting. We're also looking at some other things that um, I can't mention at the moment, but we are very excited. All I, all I will say is it's also turbocharged, but um, um, I think that's going to be a game changer for the business. Um, it, it's, you know, we know that, I mean, we don't get me wrong. We like the, the focus and then the, the STs and the RSs and, but, there's a finite amount of customers, mm -hmm. uh, you know, with these cars. And so we need to take on um, more platforms if we want to grow the business. And we do want to grow the business because we think, we feel, we're confident that we have a great DNA um, when we design products and, and our systems and our upgrade systems and just the way we do things. We think that that, that will translate over to many different um, vehicle platforms. And so we want to apply that to these and not just really um, remain concentrated on, you know, the Focus and, and Fiesta. Again, 
don't give me yeah I, we love those i mean i've always been a huge huge fan of european fords and um so we will always do those but uh, you know we want to expand the business we have to because if you're not growing you're dying and you know it's we can't if you look at if you look at companies like say like Cobb, look how many different platforms they do, whether mm. it's Evo or Ford or now Porsche. Porsche I yeah. Mean, yeah, I mean, you know, you really in this day and age, you need if you want to expand and future proof your business, you've got to do things like that. And and that's exactly the direction we're going in. And uh, I think it's you know it's important to always have that. Uh, that goal, that vision, you know, hey, what's next? We're doing this really well, but what else can we do? And you need to look at the future because, um, if, you know, they're not going to be making these cars forever either. I mean, you know, you have to you have to evolve the business along with the automotive uh, companies in the same direction they're going, really, if you want to be in this game. And it's, you know, you look at this, where is it going? Well, is everything going to be electric in five years? Yeah, I don't know. I don't. I don't think so. I mean, I don't think Ford thinks that. I don't think anybody really thinks that. There, yeah, there will be a lot more electric cars and there could be more, you know, autonomous cars. Who knows where that's really going? Maybe 30 or 40 years before they have uh, electric cars down to the point where they have the range that people want. Mm, that people the, want, yeah. Exactly. I mean, you know, <clears throat> they're cool if you live here in LA and you need to drive 40 miles a day or 100 miles a day or whatever. You see Teslas everywhere. It's a great yeah, looking car. It does, yeah. <laughs> great looking car i mean that's they're nice and but yeah people modify those too you know whether it's wheels or suspension i mean so you know when you look at the performance marketplace whether you know it's hardcore stuff it, a lot of that's really about personalization people want to personalize their car whether it's adding a wing or adding an intake or adding more power i mean a lot of that is just because they want to make it th their own and regardless of how the market evolves I think there's always a place out there for a company like ours <clears throat> that's doing, you know, performance enhancements. Mm -hmm. I remember in the 80s, again, back in HKS days, it's like everything was shifting from carbureted to fuel injected. And it's like, oh, my God, what are we going to do? These cars are <laughs> Panic, well, panic. Exactly. Well, soon thereafter, it was all fixed because if, if man created it, man can fix it, can modify it or can, can change it. And that will be the case too. You know, with, with electric cars, there will be plenty of ways to to modify them or enhance them, you know, may become more difficult. And the ones that the people that have the resources or the technology or the ability to do it will be the winners. And yeah. yeah, I think it's going to be very difficult, like you said, but I think that is going to be – that's going to be an interesting market, and we are actually trying to uh, – we're trying to schedule a really cool interview with somebody involved with the autonomous vehicles. Mm -hmm. um, that's something we think is just awesome, <laughs> especially – I mean, me personally, like I put – I'm going to be – Jesus, I did like 20,000 miles in six months on my RS, so I would love nothing more for that thing to drive itself while I'm sitting on the highway <laughs> all day long. <laughs> But, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's it's going to be an interesting interesting move here over the next f several years, you know, it's not in the immediate future, but uh it's going to be pretty cool. Yeah, I think was it with Jay Leno, he said something like, well, you know, 150 years ago everybody had a horse. Well, you know, people still have horses today. It's just they're used differently, <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah. So maybe that will be the case. I mean, you know, hopefully we'll we we always uh have classic cars, but you know, but it's, it would be a uh, but businesses have to change. I mean, how many how many people out there, or how many shops are selling jets for carburetors anymore? No, you know, there's yeah, nobody. Yeah. So you know, if you keep your product line and your 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 ethos within the company always looking forward, I think you'll be okay. You know, it's as long as there's fuel of some sort and the the need for cars. Cars are a lifestyle, you know, for a lot of people, and and I doubt that will change. You know, I, I, over the years, I've heard, you know, especially in reference to Japan, oh, the young people, they're, you know, they're not modifying cars. Well, everyone still goes to the Tokyo Auto Salon every yeah, year. Yeah, I they're, mean, that hasn't gone away. Yeah, they're doing Bozuzoku and uh, crazy cars. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, you know, stop the panicking. You know, use that, use that energy to create something, you know, where there wasn't something before. You know, that's what you need to do. 
Well, what is, you know, for Mountain specifically, what has been the most successful way that you have promoted the business, you know, to get the name out there and to get, you know, let people know to trust the company and then again to buy your products now? Mm -hmm. um, well, I mean, we, we, you know, we do a lot with social media. I think, of course, that's a you know, pretty prominent platform now. We do a lot. We like Instagram. That works well for us. And we do some with Facebook. Um, um, do you have yeah. a, like a shop car that you use for, you know, testing and showcasing? Yeah, we have a, well, we have an STN and RS that we use that's, that we modify and we post about it all the time. We, we do a lot of, um, uh, direct to consumer emails that people that have purchased from mm -hmm. us that, you know, so we, we have their contact info. Um, we pulled back on, uh, magazine ads. We're not doing that anymore. Um, really no ad banner ads and forums or anything like that. It's, it's, um, I think right now, I mean, the, the biz, the business and the brand have gotten to a point where, um, you know, if you're an enthusiast and you're looking for parts for your RS or ST, you, you know, you'll come across us, whether it's in a Google search or, uh, we work with people like Matt Farah on he's, he bought an RS and he has his smoking tire, mm -hmm. um, uh, a, a YouTube page or YouTube channel. And, and so we helped him out with his car and things like that help quite a lot. We, we do a lot with Ford, um, over the years and especially when mountain came to the states so we built cars uh with ford performance and they've been in in major magazines and in uh social media so it's um you know i think we've done a pretty good job with that as far as getting the brand out there i mean we're fortunate enough to have a relationship with ford that's helped elevate our brand up to a status level that uh, it may, you know, it would take a, a, a different company many years to achieve. Um, so you can't deny that. I mean, it's, it's, you know, we've been very fortunate for that. And yeah. That's if, quite the strategic partnership to have yeah, the, and if, the yeah. manufacturer backing you. Yeah. And if you had to do that from scratch, uh, or even try to get a relationship like that, it would take you years and years. But, um, for us, that's really helped out a lot, but you know, it's the other thing we like to do and is, when we have the meets here where people mm -hmm. can come and, you know, we'll get a hundred cars and uh, people like to come out and hang out and they'll, you know, we'll have the parts in the showroom where they can come and touch them and look at them or see them on a car and, you know, and talk to one of us about the parts and how they work. And, um, you know, that type of stuff, hands on. I mean, it's important for the customers to really touch and feel the products and see the quality. Um, so, that works well for us. And then we do, you know, we do the PRI show mm -hmm. for the racing yep. side of the business. That's good because you meet, meet a lot of people there and they can see the, the parts. Um, uh, you know, I think, I, I don't know, I, I wouldn't button it down to one item. I mean, I think it's just a collaborative across the way. I mean, the UK side does a really good job of getting things in magazines over there. Magazines are still widely read in, in Europe. Um, we also have our own YouTube channel where we put things up. And so multi-pronged attack, you've got to do it now. You, you know, again, back in the day, you put an ad in a magazine and, that was, it. The magazine, <laughs> and that was it. Yeah. And uh, so, you know, it's, it's, it's just trying to stay on top of that game. I mean, you, as a business owner, you, you know, you become, you know, a marketing person, you, you know, financial person, uh -huh. you know, engineer. I mean, it just, you know, many different hats for sure you wear, but, um, you know, we're always looking and we were just talking the other day. Okay. Well, Instagram's really good. What's next though? You know, yeah. it's going gonna, it's gonna to get to a point where there's so many ads on there that it's people won't, won't care. And, um, so does, uh, does mountain USA have a Snapchat channel? No, we haven't <laughs> talked about it, but, uh, that was one I'm telling you that one, like it came and it went. I mean, I remember probably a year ago, all the influential people, you know, in, in marketing side were saying uh -huh. how that was going to be so great. And I just, I, I didn't get it, <laughs> but I just, it, I just never saw it take off as much as I think people thought it was going to be. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, I, I, I've, I don't know, <laughs> my granddaughter has it, so it's hard to say, <laughs> you know, it's, it's weird, but, um, yeah, you know, you 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 need to be on top of that stuff all the time. And we fair enough, we do a lot with Facebook. I mean, there's a yeah, lot yeah. of there's a lot of uh 
groups in Facebook, ST groups, RS groups. And so we participate in some of those. And But in general, I mean, I think we're finding now that um, our best results come from um, just really speaking directly to our customers or, or potential customers, people that have signed up for our newsletters or they visit our blog and, um, you know, where they can get the information they're looking for and, and hear it from the the experts that, you know, that, I mean, meaning that, you know, it's our information. You're not relying on some, mm-hmm. some so-called expert in a forum to relay that for you. You're, 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 you know, saying it, you're telling it to him directly. So that works quite well. Well, so what is the one year plan for the business? Like, where do you expect to see Mountain Tune USA at the beginning of 2018? Well, 2016 was really good for us. I mean, we, we, you know, we were on a uh, very aggressive growth um, plan and we achieved uh, our goals. Uh, we were up 70%. Um, but for, for uh, I mean, it's hard to keep that pace up naturally as the business matures. But I think for this year, uh, I mean, the goal is to be up another 50%. Um, more products on the website. Uh, the challenge is to, you know, the, we talked about earlier to get the, uh, the the Roger Clark, the RCM website up and running mm-hmm. and, and get that going in the Subaru parts. But I mean, it's just, we've got so many irons in the fire right now between road, the streetcar parts and then the racing side of the business. Um, I'd like to see some more um, uh, movement in the racing side of the business for us here. I mean, we have a lot of opportunities that are starting to develop. And I think you know, they, they will come to fruition this year as the, you know, the economy feels pretty good to me right now. And people I talk to that are still, you know, that are in business are telling me the same thing. So one year plan is, you know, it's, we have a plan, we have a five year plan and the, the plan is to achieve these goals every year and, and get the business up to a certain point and, and keep it growing. Well, how about we uh, get moving on into the quick answer questions? So I'm just going to fire these mm-hmm. off and then just, you know, reply back with, uh, you know, kind of the first thing that comes up. So tell us about a game-changing product that you've seen in the last year. And this can be either, you know, something really exciting for you guys or, you know, something that you may have seen at PRI or, you know, what's something cool that you've seen that's going to hit the market? I saw some stuff at, at, at PRI, like high pressure fuel pump for direct injection. Yeah, there's a lot of these pumps out there, but people aren't using them uh, because there's no way to tune them. So yeah. unless yeah. you're running a standalone, you know, a very expensive standalone ECU. So um, yeah, there's the a company are- that I've been discussing, um, been in, in communication with that's developing some stuff for the RS for a pump and injectors. And it's, uh, I'm hoping they can get it all sorted out. So I'll have to reach out to them here again pretty soon, see how that's coming along. But mm-hmm. yeah, it's, it's that, that could be pretty helpful, but again, it's very expensive, you know, yep. doing upgrading your high pressure fuel pump and your high pressure injectors is much more expensive than adding an auxiliary fuel, um, port injection. <laughs> so yeah, let's, but let's it's, see where you know, go with that. Yeah. But to me, it's, you know, it's the clean way to do it. It's you it know, is, yeah. running, you know, additional fuel injectors or meth injects. I mean, it's just kind of dirty, but it, people do it, but yeah. Yeah. Good old meth injection. We, E85 mm-hmm. really killed that in the Evo market, but I have seen a resurgence in it <laughs> in, the, in yeah. the past or, you know, it pretty recently. So we'll see if that really makes a, makes a comeback. Um, so tell us about kind of some of the softwares that you're using um, on a daily basis, either, you know, kind of to run the business or to manage the marketing, you know. Um. Yeah, we, we use, uh, oh, well, naturally Instagram and Facebook. But I mean, as far as, um, well, that would be more of an app. But uh, Adobe Creative Suites um, and, and Lightroom, we use that a lot. Um, and then on the uh, business side, um, I wanted this business to be cloud-based when we formed it. So we actually... You, we use QuickBooks online, but with a lot of plugins, um, mm-hmm. a lot of apps that that help it, and uh, it's actually pretty good because, um, you know, we can we can work on it. Well, I don't know if it's good because you can work on it when you're at home. Yeah, well, yeah, <laughs> you, yeah. know, you know, if I'm in a hotel room in in England, I can still see what's going on, and uh, so that's it works. It works pretty good. Um, but I'd say those are the two main things. Yeah, we've seen uh, quite the shift to the QuickBooks online um, for lots of the speed shops out there. So uh, mm-hmm. that's something that we've had to address with our software as well. So it's been, uh, it's been pretty amazing and QuickBooks is getting it figured out. You know, they are definitely late to the game with uh, online 
accounting software, but they're the they're the uh, elephant in the room as far as you know, giant in the room as far as accounting goes. So I think they're going to get it figured out here pretty soon. Yeah, no, the, it's it gets better all the time. Every time I log on to it, it's like they've done some improvement. But but yeah, that's our our go to setup here, and and. Um, so, and then, you know, the usual stuff like MailChimp and that, we, we do a lot with that. Yeah, Kevin calls that monkey mail. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we, we use uh, Constant Contact for ours, which is kind of the same deal, but it does make a, the direct mail a lot easier. Um, are, you, are you using anything to manage um, your social media feeds, um, like a Hootsuite or anything like that? No, we looked at Hootsuite and, and there's several others, but um, – no, because Not to be honest point. with you, I mean, we mostly just use Instagram, and, and we're using Instagram a lot more than we do Facebook now. Okay. A lot more. And, you know, I think it's just because, you know, we we've, we seem – unless, you know, if we want to promote something on Facebook, we get traffic. But if you don't promote it, you get no interaction. You get so. nothing. Yeah they, yeah, they got us. They tricked us. Yep. <laughs> um, so what about on your phone? What's, uh, you know, something personally that you – you know, a favorite app that you use? Uh, well, from, you know, I use our, the, the app that allows us to, allows me to see our online orders. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Fun yeah, to watch so that give, one. Yeah. It gives me the back end uh, access to the back end of our website. I use that a lot. And obviously Instagram, um, we use WhatsApp a lot, um, to, to, as a chat, you know, with, um, people around the building here or, okay. or, uh, the guys in the UK. Um, yeah, we use Slack. Uh -huh. um, which is similar. I think it's pro it's more. I don't know if you call it more businessy, but uh, I hear more. You know, lay people using WhatsApp. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I haven't looked. I mean, it was just, you know, kind yeah, of using it. It's good. It, just, yeah. <laughs> it works fine. And then and and Box. Um, we keep a lot of stuff in. You know, we have a our own Box set up, and so between transferring images back and forth with guys in the UK at our UK office and just various documents here. Oh, so uh, um, like Dropbox. Yeah, it's just um, I don't Slightly know if it's different. actually drop. It's just called Box. Okay, so, so it's another. Yeah. It's a cloud storage. Yeah, it's cloud storage. Is all okay, it is. So we use that a lot. Um, and then my United Airlines app, I use that a lot. <laughs> okay, yeah, That's, for all uh, the flights that you have to check into, huh? Yep, yep. And uh, let's see what else. I think that's you know, I mean, it's like anything. You got a ton of apps on here, and how many do you really use? <laughs> yeah. Um, well, what about? Say, you know, what about uh, a physical tool? What's your favorite tool you use out in the shop? Mm, solvent tank. <laughs> doing some cleaning, huh? Yeah, doing cleaning. And uh, do you guys but, have? Is it an ultrasonic cleaner? Uh, we have actually quite a few things here. We've got a, just a good old fashioned solvent tank, and then we have uh, uh, several ultrasonic cleaners. We have a high pressure uh, heated cleaner because we're doing the the rally cross engines here now. So, um, you know, when, before we they build, get dirty. Uh, they get dirty. <laughs> but uh, so yeah, we have a full engine build. So all of those tools are uh, put to use. But uh, yeah, I mean, uh, it's it's a developing business, so there's new things added all the time. But uh, yeah, this the good old solvent tank. Maybe I'll clean some of my old classic car parts now and again in there. But there you go. <laughs> yeah. Well, what about what uh, what car are you driving to and from work every day? Uh, either a Focus ST or a Focus RS. Um, we have an EcoBoost Mustang too that I may drive on occasion. But, yeah. Um, lately, I've been driving the Focus ST. So I, I my Focus ST we've um, <clears throat> that I bought. When we started the business, which I was driving every day, we pulled it. Uh, we pulled the engine out, and it's actually getting ready to go back in. But with uh, rods, pistons, and cams, it's actually been on the dyno. Um, we've been doing some testing on the cams, and uh, so we're going to have some social media stuff on that pretty quick. But um, yeah, I mean, it's. I got the dyno sheet last night. The engineer brought it in, so it's putting out. And this is at the crank because mm -hmm. it's on engine dyno. So with still room to go, 393 horsepower to the crank. So that compares to 350 to a Focus RS. So, yeah, yeah. So what was the, what is the Focus ST? Have you guys done a stock one? Do you know offhand? Yeah, it's it's 250. Okay, yeah. So it's 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 a lot more. A big jump. <laughs> a big jump. 150 more horsepower, and uh, so yeah, the torque is phenomenally more. It's uh, the torque. Well, I'd have to do peak to peak, but it's like the same type of gains. So. Yeah. 
Because that's a two liter, right? Two liter. Yeah. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, the RS gets the two three, the big mm-hmm. liter. Mm-hmm. Yeah, same bore and stroke, really. The only difference is the crank. So the crank is eleven millimeters longer stroke in the RS. So. Gotcha. Um, RS has a slightly better cylinder head design too, but very similar engines. But, but well, yeah, so, hey, driver. So where do you think the future of automotive performance is going? I would say it's it's for the foreseeable future, say five to ten years. I I think it's going to remain virtually the same, but those that have um, the ability to tune the ECUs. Um, I, th- I think that's going to be uh, the challenge going forward. I think that you're going to see the OEs locking down the ECUs more and more because the ECUs are more and more integrated in the total vehicle control system, meaning that, uh, for example, maybe a door is open and the car won't start. And because of liability issues in that, they're going to be locking it down. And I think it's going to be hard for companies unless you have an OE relationship to – have the ability to tune them. Yeah, nice. and that's uh, even the RS has one of those. If you unplug the exhaust flapper, yeah. you can't select the drive modes. <laughs> like Which what, is strange. What yeah. engineer thought that needed to happen? <laughs> yeah, it's just super yeah. weird. So you think you think it'll actually be maybe a shrinking of the number of people tuning the cars? You know, compared to the population. Well, I don't know about that, but I think it's going to be you know th- these companies like say Cobb or, or SCT or anybody that's doing devices that, that tune, I think they're going to have uh, a challenge. I think it's going to be harder and harder for them to reverse engineer the ECUs and gain access mm-hmm. to them and be able to tune them. Because, you know, for example, I know a lot of the European car, like some of the BMWs are very hard to to get around now. And I think you're going to see that become more widespread because the vehicle manufacturers really don't, most of them don't want you to yeah. tune your car. Yeah. It's in their best interest to make it impossible. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, totally and, understandable. You know, and nothing is really ever impossible, but at to what cost is it going yes. to be? Yes. So. Nobody's going to want to get a flash tune that costs $20,000 on a $30,000 yeah. car. So. so I think that's that type of stuff. And, and, um, you know, just the, the integration between everything. I mean, we were a little uh, concerned with the RS early on when we heard, you know, when, because we have a pretty close relationship with Ford. We, oh, it's going to have this, it's going to have that. And we thought, oh, my God, what's going to happen when you change the springs? Is that going to mess the – but no, it doesn't, you know. And, and But I think that could come – there could come a point in time where anything you replace on the car is going to throw a mill light, a malfunction indicator light that's – that's lamp that's going to – you know, cause issues like yeah. unplugging your exhaust valve, you know, yeah, yeah. I, I see that coming sooner than later. And, you know, how tuning companies like ourselves get around it is anyone's guess at this point. Luckily for us, we have a very good relationship with Ford and yeah, they yeah. like us to tune their cars, <laughs> yeah. help them out. So hopefully we'll be in a good position, but some of these guys may have issues. Gotcha. Very cool. Excellent insight. Um, so to close this out, you know, how do people connect with your company and, and uh, you know, get a hold of you guys and find out more about your products? Well, the best thing is just go to our website, which is mountunusa.com. Very cool, man. Well, I really right. appreciate you uh, taking All some right. time and talking with us and uh, right. look forward to seeing more cool stuff out of you guys. All right. Thanks a lot. Thanks for listening to Do It For A Living. You can find out more about this guest, this show, and even details about what we just talked about at our website, doitforaliving.net. Check out the Facebook page at facebook.com slash doitforaliving and tell us who you want to hear from. And most importantly, subscribe to the podcast. Click subscribe. Do it now. Seriously. I'll wait while you grab your phone. Open up.